So I'm ever so sorry. I'm really uh, uh, sorry that I don't speak your language. I, I, did, I did at the age of 15, but that was quite a long time ago. <laughs> and if you don't practice it. So, uh, and by the way, if I, if I speak too quickly, then just somebody just like slow me down, yes? But I have got quite a lot to get through. Um, now, you'll see on the programme, there is no title. So you might think, oh, well, that gives her lots of freedom. Actually, we did agree on what we'd be talking about today. And I'm not talking just about Spark Europe. I'm talking a bit about what we do. But it's actually more about our key goal is to make open the default. And what I want to talk about today is what does it take to make open the default for publications? So I, I like to talk about open science, but I was told we should focus on open access. Good point, because there's still quite a lot to do there. Um, so I came up with, so I, I was thinking, well, what do we still need to do to make open the default? So I came up with 10 prerequisites. What are the 10 things that are essential for us to reach that goal? Now, I'm not going to make a promise of when this is going to actually happen, because it has a lot to do with the likes of us, with LIBA, with national governments, with the EC, and yourselves, yes, to make it happen. But let me take you through uh, what my opinion is here. So firstly, what is absolutely essential is that we have a strong, supportive copyright um, law in place. Um, and here, I'd like to tell you briefly. So I know, uh, I think most of you know that Libra has been leading very much on the copyright reform with TDM. Um, and that is what they are doing fantastically, and we support what they do. Uh, we came in to... Uh, help with, lead this coalition against um, a publisher lobby that has come in recently. Um, so for the European Commission Directive copyright, there are new suggestions on the table made by uh, scientific publishers, uh, and we are uh, fighting against these proposals on the table, and we have lobbyists uh, working with that uh, big uh, group. So basically, we have some publishers who see copyright as another way of generating income, possibly. So this new ancillary right for publishers might mean that even though we might have open access publications, they might charge us to be able to get access behind a link, or we need to get permission. This is not what we want. So if we've worked hard to get open access, we don't, do not want another obstacle. So we are fighting to stop this from happening. Um, there's also um, another article which threatens a lot of the work that we've been doing with repositories where they, it's for uh, digital platforms, which is a very big uh, term, but they are uh, also proposing that we should have uh, filtering obligations, we should, if anything gets uploaded illegally, that the owner of that repository, in our cases, is legally liable. So this is new as well. So these are bigger administrative burdens for us, which we don't want. So we are also raising awareness of the importance of repositories and to exclude these from uh, these new proposals on the table. Also, like Libra, we also want TDM for more beneficiaries and also more fair use of material for education, but that's another theme. So what we've been doing is we've come up with some infographics to, to tell parliamentarians who are taking these votes and also the Council of Ministers to tell them what's important for us for innovation, what are repositories about, etc. So number two, so sorry to start with kind of a bit of bad news, but we're working hard with a bigger group to see whether we can uh, prevent this from going through, okay? So it's important that we ensure open access to open access, if you like, through copyright law. Um, number two, what's also absolutely uh, critical, as we all know, we heard, a, we heard it from the bits I picked up from French uh, earlier. It's about the evaluation and reward structure. So without that, you may have lots of policies top-down, but the researchers don't have the motivation 
to do the actual work and to share to, to, to certain extents. So <clears throat> in the press, for example, here the economists, uh, you see increasingly articles where this article looks at alternative metrics, uh, extend the concept of citation beyond journal mention. So questioning, and we all know that the metric system is broken. I'm not going to go into that now. But we need to challenge that, and we need to raise awareness of some of those new proposals on the table. And I'll come to that in a second. Um, now, funders, uh, what they can do here is, of course, demand not just journal articles to make them open access, but other material, and uh, so mandate. So we know that this is a very supportive uh, policy. And if they say we need open access, this has repercussions on other funders. Um, we also welcome, they were um, one of the first uh, funders to have an open access policy, but what, what they also have is, um, so if we're thinking about rewarding other types of publications rather than just the, in the top journal articles of uh, impact factors, um, January 2017, they also permit researchers to cite preprints or pre-peer-reviewed manuscripts in their grant applications. So if big funders are also saying these are valid and they are valuable, uh, we will get more material in our, in our repositories or in the subject repositories. So this is good news. Uh, what we can also do is take stands, and this is what uh, publishers and institutions, it was also already mentioned, I think, in, in the overture uh, earlier on, Dora, <clears throat> where you have almost 13,000 have signed Dora, about 870 organisations, so where they want to stop the use of journal-based metrics, right? So it's a declaration. However, how are you going to implement it? So that's another question, yes? So there are some uh, publishers and organisations who've signed up to it, but this is something that we can also raise awareness in our institutions. Should we be really using these measures also in internally, shouldn't we sign up to such a declaration? And if you haven't yet done so, or if you don't know it, please take a look. Maybe that's a small action that you can take at least to have a look at it and perhaps raise awareness with your senior management. Now, the Lyon Manifesto was also mentioned. This is a very interesting um, alternative. Uh, I've got uh, links to all of... Uh, my sli uh, slides and resources here. The Leiden Manifesto was uh, developed in Leiden in the Netherlands, um, and it looks at, they have a roadmap of alternative metrics, and this is also very nice to raise awareness of. This is developed by uh, CWTS, so their professors uh, coming from scientists, how to reapproach the way that we evaluate research. So that's also very interesting. Um, development, it's about two years old, but still, it's, it's still not very well known in the research community, so we can also help them to uh, raise awareness of this and for re research communities to discuss the relevance of different types of research being valid. <clears throat> um, also, the Times, there's, uh, there are also younger researchers striking back. I don't know if, ever, if anybody's read this article. Academics strike back against bad science. So this is a group of Cambridge young researchers, admittedly a bit privileged, um, but <clears throat> who are um, saying that they, uh, they want to be scientists rather than academics. So under the pressure of publishing a lot in, uh, in, in journals that actually are not of high merit for them. They want to do the concrete, strong research and not be under pressure to publish in the high impact journals. So they've also taken a stand. Um, it's a nice article to read. So young researchers, there's also quite a movement to create change here. So <clears throat> that's about evaluating the research that you are producing as, as, a, as, as a research, as an author. But what's also important, if we're talking about evaluation or assessment, it's about your career, right? Um, and here we have, for example, I think he was a former Harvard dean, 
where in Nature there was an article that came out in September, uh, faculty promotion must assess reproducibility. Okay, so this is not so related to open access, more open data or open science, but still it's big um, uh, research administrators, managers saying that we have a responsibility to be um, a good scientists and to um, reproduce our research, okay? Um, now, in the United States, um, I don't know whether, I think a, a number of you know um, Ella McKiernan. So she's been working on a project with uh, several others in the United States to have a look, actually, at the um, current practices in the review, promotion, and tenure process across about, a, I think it's 100 and, 129 universities and 382 academic units to see how far open access and open science features. Well, um, only 2% mention open access. These are, this is very, very new information. They've been working on this for, for about a year. Um, and when it's mentioned, it's usually mentioned related to predatory OA journals, right? Um, and that it's inadequately refereed. So this is bad news for us. But it's very good news that, that, that we have this information and we need to raise awareness here. We need to do something about this. However, there are others who are concretely doing things about this. So <clears throat> the Open Science Policy Platform at the Commission, there are a number of groups that are moving policy forward here. And they... Uh, they have been working, this is a recent document that's just come out from this working group, looking at the evaluation of research careers fully, fully acknowledging open science practices. So if you haven't looked at that yet, please do. But lots of institutions here around the table, um, <clears throat> and UCL, uh, like Liège, uh, and others amongst us, but there are some who are really the leading lights in open science, UCL, they, they have just published this, actually. Oh, actually, no, it, it's, not, it's not very openly published, this. I had to go... Um, anyway, I used my contacts. <laughs> and uh, I, I wasn't allowed to publish the whole document, but excerpts, right? Now, the fantastic news is that this new academic career framework, they have, for all research grades... They've inset, they, uh, this applies to everybody. All research outputs are available through open access wherever possible. I know it's a little bit soft, but it's still in there, right? And as part of indicators of impact in the teaching section, for certain grades, adoption of open access dissemination processes and routes, okay? That's also mentioned. So it's explicit. And I hope to see more of this. So this is starting, and we need to also include this as part of many other uh, uh, um, um, <sighs> parts of how we evaluate uh, uh, researchers, yes? So, <clears throat> now, where would we be today without strong policy? Um, so, yes, it's top-down, but this is really, we know this has been very essential for progress for more open science and open access. Horizon 2020, I had already mentioned. The Competitiveness Council last year, uh, where <clears throat> ministers of education, culture, science, industry came together and they agreed to make, by 2020, um, publications, public access to uh, public uh, research open access by 2020 as the default, right? So that's a, that's a great thing that they've signed up for. It's true, it's up to us now to implement that, but it's good that everybody's aligned. I already mentioned the European Commission has a number of um, uh, um, themes that they are looking at with a number of experts around Europe. Uh, on publishing models, the science cloud, metrics, rewards, <laughs> skills, citizen science, etc. Et so things are moving forward, coming with recommendations to help national governments and institutions to move forward there too. 
Um, so, in response, okay, this is Norway. This is a, a, I'm mentioning Norway as an example, and I know you have your own national strategies, which we heard about today. But <clears throat> this influences then countries also very much to set up their own goals and guidelines for the research community to follow. Um, we are also seeing, uh, it's a bit levelling out the policies um, here, we see a growth, um, but a lot of the time at the moment, those who haven't policies uh, in place, they've been waiting for the national policies and haven't implemented locally, so they look towards the national policy, so we'll see. But as long as there are policies in place, this is a, a strong message, obviously, that this is the uh, responsible way to move forward with our research. Pasteur for OA was also mentioned. This was a very, uh, uh, I think, valuable project that brought good practices on policy level together uh, from across different countries, and some of those resources have gone into the Foster project <clears throat> and the, uh, the knowledge of the, the, the nodes together with open air. They're also very good resources of information if you want to know about things going on in Europe. And as part of Pasteur for OA, <clears throat> uh, Alma Swan in 2015, she analysed the policies and to see, match the policies against the content of a repository. So what makes a good policy? Well, there are no surprises that the Liège model, of course, <laughs> is uh, the leading light here. Um, so just going back, you must deposit, you cannot waive deposit, and link deposit to research evaluation. This is the real must-have. Now, the good news is, Although Liège was alone for a while with their innovative policy, similar policies, as according to Raw Map, there are about 51 that have similar policies with these three criteria, okay, from these countries. Interestingly enough, there are quite a lot in Turkey and then spread across um, different countries in, in Europe um, uh, and Asia, I think a couple, Canada. So, <clears throat> now, what I think is really critical and that has been missing for a while, which we're focusing on now too, I talked about funders being um, really instrumental. We don't know enough about the, the policies that funders have in place. We know about Welcome, uh, and we know about the European Commission, but what about lots of funders in different countries? What policies do they have in place? And how can we raise awareness of some of the stronger policies in place maybe like Hefke or Welcome, um, to stimulate them to feature open in their policies. Now, the problem we have a little bit, though, is because this is still quite new, uh, it's quite difficult to measure the impact that those policies have had. So we can't necessarily say uh, that the Hefke policy has been very successful. They are actually looking at that now, and that will be coming out shortly. But... So this is a challenge we have, but we want to find out more about the policies of funders. So what mandates are in place? Do they prefer green or gold? What kind of trends are there? Do they have preferred places for publishing? How do they monitor? And what about compliance? Have they measured? Um, and also we'll be looking at which are more mature and which are still under development Am I going at a speed that's okay for everybody? Yes, good. There is a lot, I know. <clears throat> um, so that's coming soon. Um, so number four, four, what's really critical, we don't talk about this enough, but it's really, I think somebody in the first presentation, multi-stakeholders, I heard that word and everybody giggled because of course it was an English word in, in it, huge, massive French sentence, but it's really about working together with so many stakeholders, how important that is and whether we're doing that enough as libraries, yes? The libraries here amongst ourselves, or whether the researchers are really talking to us enough, or, are the, or the service providers when they're thinking about new things, um, or the funders for that matter. <clears throat> so it's really critical, 
uh, also for us, to try and forge partnerships and work together. So with the advocacy organisations, of course, but also with the research institutions, and I don't just mean universities or uh, other research institutions, I also mean academies and learned societies. They have quite something to gain and lose here, yes? Um, funders, both public and private. Also research assessment bodies, so if we look at the UK, uh, they're very important here. Um, and also any service institution, it could be a publisher, it could be, you know, re repository service providers, all sorts, yeah. So we need to work together, and those things are happening. We heard about some from somebody else on the Open Science Policy Platform. Oh, sorry, no, that was the cloud. So the cloud, the, Europe, the Open Science Cloud is an example of projects. So when we do a lot of this collaboration, it's through projects, but we can probably do more also by reaching out, engaging, discussing, and I know we do workshops and things like that, but the more we do, the better. There are also very interesting developments. <clears throat> I don't know, I didn't understand the French enough today, so maybe you'll say, oh yeah, we're all doing this. But Sweden recently, very recently, last week, presented in Norway on their approach to open access and their action plan. And um, she's actually on our board, so I'm very, very glad of that, uh, who's leading this. <clears throat> So they have a system in place where they have the Association of Swedish Higher Education involved with all vice rectors and library directors, research funders, including their secretary generals, other OA experts and bibliometric experts, other researchers, of course, from different disciplines, and both senior and early career researchers, and the National Library of Sweden, who's actually leading this. They together are approaching open access and the action plan. I mean, this is a really fantastic way to approach it. All stakeholders getting around the table and really thinking together, how are we going to make this happen, right? So this is a really nice example, I think, of an approach to that. And of course, how we also collaborate and share is at events like these and more, and such as this one. And also, there are other platforms or networks, the open air nodes, I already mentioned on national levels. You've got EC national contact points, Science Europe has an open access working group. The Open Science Monitor is just about to be revived. And OATP. I wonder how, how many of you know OATP? Lots of people don't, so it's fine. Or maybe who does know it? A few, not so many. This is a really fantastic resource. It's actually run by Peter Suber, so that's not a bad name to have behind your service. Um, and it basically aggregates news from across the world on open access and open science, right? We're also feeding this with content from Switzerland and from Germany and Italy. We're kind of trying to get more European content. So if you don't know it, I think I bring it up a bit later. <clears throat> but... It's important that we also structurally share this knowledge amongst ourselves, right? <clears throat> now, that's all very well, but how are we going to make our material open access? What kind of opportunities are there? And it needs to be at a fair price, obviously. Um, <clears throat> so The Guardian, again, the popular press, uh, uh, raising awareness of the profitable business of scientific publishing. So there are initiatives, as many of us know, um, where you have more cooperative approaches to funding open access. These are open access books. You've got the Open Library of Humanities, which is more focused on journals, where libraries contribute money so that they don't charge APCs and make journal articles openly available for certain disciplines. This very recently came out. There's also an increase. We in libraries, some of us are, are, um, um, are working together with our university presses or setting up new ones, um, also to support certain academics 
uh, or certain multidisciplinary groups to help them publish anew. This is so. This is an interesting study. That JISC is uh, in the UK is exploring how they could perhaps support universities professionally in how to build good university presses. So it's quite quite a nice uh, report to have a look at where they are with that. Um, and there are a number of universities that have uh, good presses uh, established. Um, now, <clears throat> we don't know that much about open access monographs and books and business models and what, uh, what might work, what's working now, what, what, what's on offer. This is a recent study that just came out from Knowledge Exchange, so that's also interesting for you to look at. Um, there are some recommendations that they make that we can then, perhaps on our national levels or in the disciplinary groups, address if we want to make our books uh, more openly available. But also, <clears throat> publishing is not just in books or articles, of course. Um, so in the life sciences, they believe that preprints are going to become a lot more important. They already are, for example, in the area of physics, in mathematics increasingly. <clears throat> you can see archive, they started in 1991. They have more than a million records, but increasingly recently there have been quite a few new um, disciplinary repositories popping up, yes, where researchers are sharing material. Here you can see, this is a nice slide showing the, the boom of materials in bioarchive, for example, of preprints. <clears throat> and it's not just about uh, sharing your material and getting it uh, accessed as quickly as possible or to comment or uh, build on your research. Here there is evidence that was shared by Jessica Folker from um, ASAP Bio. Uh, tweets, for any doubters, two of our recent bioarchive preprints received submission invitations from three well-respected journals. So, you know, the vicious rumour that, oh, if I put my material uh, in the repository, then nobody's going to publish it, is nonsense here. Here's some evidence that actually it's more visible and journals might be more interested in publishing you. Okay? <clears throat> and <clears throat> there are other very innovative journals uh, like eLife, um, and tools that they are developing. So talking about journals that are no longer static, where code changes, code is integrated into the article and changes the article. So it becomes more of a dynamic rather than a static uh, output. So I think we're going to see more of that. Of course, we can't forget about the big publishers, right? And they are increasingly giving us choices. So we've got Springer with Open Choice. We've got Taylor and Francis with, with new publishing options, buying open access journals to add to their uh, collections. But beware, because of course, when we are negotiating on the deals, you need to take that into account. And it's not, it's not just about reading, but it's actually about writing and having the rights and paying for that into the future. And you know about the German deal. The latest there is that there are 200 organizations that at the moment are not going to renew their Elsevier deal uh, under the present conditions. And quite a few prestigious researchers who are not going to review material, etc. OK? So I know you've heard about this, but it's an important one. Uh, fin Finland, you might not have heard about this, no deal, no review, it's a similar thing where there are a number of uh, people from the research community who've said under the these circumstances we will not collaborate and support in the publishing process. Now, <clears throat> if we're thinking about funding of open access also here um, and maintaining the current system, uh, Ralph Schimmer, he wrote a paper for us, so he's the leader of OA 2020, if you haven't already heard, uh, which is, would surprise me because they're really out there. So they believe that there's enough money in the system and more to flip the current journal system OA. 
right? So they're working towards that. This is very ambitious. We published uh, his paper and we invited a number of um, scientists and experts to comment. So th what are the pros and cons? Um, and here, this is the OA cooperative study led in the US is also looking at how to uh, collaborate on funding um, OA publishing as libraries. All right, if you don't know that, have a look. Um, academies and learned societies, we need, to ch we need to, for them to change their publishing platforms because a lot of the time they're locked in with the big publishers, perhaps. Uh, the, this, uh, the European Geosciences Union, all, all of their material is OA. So we also need to investigate how can we move them to go OA, right? Because a lot of the time, that's a, uh, that's a source of income for them, their, their journal. So can we, get, can we see, explore other models where they still gain that uh, income, but not through journals to make sure their materials open access? How am I doing for time? Ooh. OK, so, <clears throat> sorry, <laughs> pardon? Well, so um, what's also really important, which we are doing, but I think we could do a lot more here, is us as institutions taking more of a lead in disseminating our own research, not just leaving it up to the publishers, right? So I've talked about OA publishing within our own institution, uh, as presses, for example, but we're doing things with ORCID, which supports our Chris's, are also serving senior management and disseminating about the material, uh, the, our, our, our academic output. We can promote successful cases and stories that we can grab from our repositories or by talking to our researchers and also obviously using social media. And there are enablers of sharing out there to help us with this. I already talked about copyright law, institutional licensing. This is a new initiative, relatively new, maybe a year, year and a half they've been working on this in the UK and other countries are interested. This is where a research organisation would, regardless of what the publisher wants, no action or is required on the author that you make the peer-reviewed manuscript publicly available in your repository and assign it a non-commercial CC licence and sub-licence it to the author. So it means they are trying to work in some organisations to get this set up that the organization has a license with the author, okay? So this would make it really simple for our repositories to get the final version in our repositories. So I think that's very valuable to watch out. Creative Commons was mentioned today as well. We're looking at how valuable or not the Spark author addendum is. So we need to raise awareness, all of us, about the rights, author rights, yes? What can I do? What can't I do? What options do I have? We need to do that so that people feel confident. Um, something else. Oh, there's so much to do, isn't there? Um, but it's also really important. We often sell this. Oh, yes, you know, open access is really valuable for government, NGOs, SMEs, citizens. But what are we doing about this? Are we really reaching out to them? Yes. Do they really know about it? Or have we got cases that we can tell our governments or funders, you know, we need to do more of this because this is generating such and such, or they have been able to do this because of access to X, Y, or Z, right? So this is something we also want to focus on a bit more. What's also really important, obviously, um, <clears throat> once you have options of publishing in place, that you have an infrastructure in place to access research. Uh, I talked about repositories. Most of us have them. This is uh, something that we developed for the copyright uh, campaign to look at uh, the density of repositories in Europe. So compared to the rest of the world, Europe has, a, has many, right? I think we've got about 1,500 compared. It could be a better map, and we're going to work on that. But at least it shows, you know, for... For the members of parliament, that kind of works quickly. Um, and we, it's also important to 
for others to understand what are the values of repositories, what do they do for different groups, for the policymaker, the student, the researcher, not-for-profit. If you haven't already seen this flyer, please go and Google it. Okay, and we're offering various things in our repositories. Let me skip through that. This is an interesting one. In Germany, for example, they are funding disciplinary repositories, but where libraries are working together with licensed material, working together on better deals for licensed material for a group like here, art historians, but they're bringing open access material into this platform. They're also providing uh, information on where can you publish open access for the art historian. They also have a, a forum. So these are also interesting things that we could be doing where you bring uh, lots of things together into one space for, you, for a disciplinary community. And this is in Germany and in the German language. What you're also seeing increasingly is that there are more open research platforms that funders are setting up. So the Gates Foundation, but also Welcome, where they're also becoming publishers, where they are asking you to upload your content and different types of material. So it's quite an interesting space to watch there. So it's not just institutions publishing or other innovative business models being developed, but also funders. Uh, I really do have to go very soon because otherwise I miss my flight. Um, <clears throat> uh, you might have seen something on this. I'd like to talk about just focusing here. I think we all know that there are some big publishers out there who are buying up some really essential services like B Press, Mendeley, and we know what the consequences of that are. So we wanted to, to, to try and ensure that some of our open science infrastructure remains free and independent. So how do we do that? We think that we can do that by crowdfunding it by the users, by the community that depends on it. Um, you can get my slides and look at, look at this. Cameron Nealon has some really good uh, principles for open scholarly infrastructure. So you might have seen this come along. If you haven't yet, perhaps you have a, have a, have a Google or look at scos.org. This is a... We want to help sustain the infrastructure to support the implementation of open science through crowdfunding. This is the group that developed the idea. So we've got, the, we've got library groups here, IFLA, Lieber, uh, Sparks, Watch Europe, um, also Australia, but we've also got research organisations like EUA, European Research Council, Science Europe. Okay. They're not all members now of this coalition that's evaluating the uh, services, but we, for a pilot, we have now chosen Sherpa Romeo and DOAJ, where we all feel that these are really essential services. We want to ensure that they live on at least for the next three years. How much does it cost? They have had to deliver quite a lot of uh, substantial information on costs, on um, who are they serving, what are their plans for the future. And we, rent, we then review them against these criteria. And once we're happy with that, we then, um, yes, we then come to you, which happened three weeks ago. We're starting a campaign where we would like to reach out to you to say, to be able to fund these two services, I know this money is not peanuts, right, admittedly, but... For the start, we want to see whether we can, from a number of you, uh, crowdfund to fund some of these services together, right? We have monitoring tools in place for that. So I'd like you to have a look at scos.org and also pose any questions or any doubts. It's a new thing. It's still a pilot, yes? But this is an initiative where we really feel we, we can take responsibility ourselves. We're dependent on it and let's keep it free. <clears throat> so, we all know what's, what's critical, of course, is everybody knows what to do with all these options. So the researchers, they need to be educated and well-informed. Foster is a key resource here. 
we all know. Eiffel is also, has, is also doing fantastic things across the world. And OATP already mentioned, so the URL is there. Um, and lastly, <clears throat> I really think, I can't, under, I, I can't uh, emphasize this enough. It's really, for this to really work, it has to be the researchers who lead this forward. Yes, we have to do a lot of preparation to get them there, but it's the champions who are going to make this a success. Yes, you've got the top-down policy, but the ones who are actually going to do the work and gladly and going to benefit are the researchers. So they have to drive this. That's my last point. And it's the young researchers where you hear hundreds of them hearing about uh, uh, what they're doing with open but also, <clears throat> we are trying to showcase some uh, open champions. So, prominent figures, also young researchers, what are they doing? Share their stories. Why is it important to be open? What still needs to be done? These are not the best or the top. They are examples. And we want to have more. We don't have any from Switzerland yet. So, if you can think of any, some great lights who are doing fantastic work, please, we want them in here. Right? So, I think <laughs> that's pretty much. So, and the champions and the researchers, we don't really, I see them as so as real assets because if we more engage, engage with the researchers, we find out what they need, we find out what they're up to, we find out what they think about what we're doing etc etc and we can also help outreach the work that they're doing in their communities raise their visibility so we'd like to showcase your champions i think i've said and my last slide is so how are you currently contributing to make open the default for publications and could you do more that's it <laughs> It's a lot, I know. <laughs>